much. And I want to thank all of you. I know how hard it is at the end of the day to sit down and go to another meeting. So thank you so much for having my dad and I here today. We speak to students all over the country, and we're really excited to get introduced to all of you and hopefully see you again after this. I'm going to show you the presentation that we do to the students. We're, of course, paring it down a little bit just because of time. Our presentation can be adjusted based on your time periods in your school. So we usually get about an hour, but we always try to keep some time for questions and answers for the students at the end, because that's the best part of the whole presentation. I will say I sent Lori a bunch of information that she will share. One of the ways that I got connected with all of you here is through our foundation. We started in honor of my dad, the Mark Schumacher Holocaust Education Foundation. That is a resources for all of you. We have a grant cycle that you're able to apply for grant money up to $1,000. And you're able to use that money for resources, materials. Now it's virtual field trips. Um, all different types of things, speakers. So know that that resource is there for you as well. So I'm gonna start this off today, giving you a little bit of background. We wrote a book about my father, which again, we will have in the resources that we're talking about. It's called Together, A Journey for Survival. And this already has curriculum content written for it. So there's a whole lesson plan that accompanies the book, as well as I can share with you resource, a resource of exa an example of how a school implemented it into their lesson plan as well. So with that, I'm going to start off and talk about our story. I'm just going to share my screen here, and I hope you're all able to see it. Uh, you're all able to see it, right? Just a little nod from somebody. Perfect. So whenever we speak, and one of the things that's really important for me to make sure you all understand is that never forget to me has two meanings. We must never forget that there are good people and we must never forget that this story needs to be told. And the story being told is already being covered by what you're doing in the classrooms. But the fact is that even in the worst of times, there are good people in this world and that's the message that we want to make sure students hear. Just some background. My father is from Poland. He's from a tiny village called Bzostek. Oh, where did it go? There it went. That's that little star right here. This tiny village of Bzostek is in the, the southeast corner of Poland. And it was surrounded, these skulls and crossbones, are some of the concentration camps you may be familiar with, such as Auschwitz, Belgic, Yanovska. It was within this area that my father survived hiding in the forests. His little village had about 1,500 people that lived in it at the beginning of the war. Of that, 500 of them were Jewish. It was a very vibrant Jewish community. My grandfather was the head of that Jewish community. By the end of the war, and by most accounts, of those 500 Jewish people that lived in this village, less than 10 of them were still alive, of which three was my dad, my grandmother, and my aunt. The first time I went back to Poland was in the early 90s. And we don't have many pictures from before the war. Of course, many of them were destroyed. We only have a couple of my grandfather. This here is a picture of my dad and his sister prior to the war. They were farmers. And just like any other kid playing out in the fields, they were just living their regular life. When we went back in the early 90s, we got to see come, some of the places that I had heard about my whole life, such as the house he grew up in. This house was in front of the fields. It was, of course, no road. And part of this house had been rented out to a family friend that was the foreman on the property. His name was Mr. Piwat, and he's a very integral part to the story that you'll hear as my dad tells you a little bit more. But what was great about this trip is I was able to hear stories, and I remember seeing this attic. And my dad had always told us this story about this attic. And being there in person, and you could see my dad's up there, and, and I remember going there, and he said, there, that's where it happened. And I remember hearing this story about this particular attic and how one day when they were hiding there, they started to hear footsteps coming up the ladder. And my grandmother quickly took her two children and she buried herself under that hay. And she said, shh, not a word. And my dad said he remembers hearing the Nazi come into the attic and there had been a pitchfork on the side. 
And that officer took the pitchfork and started stabbing into the hay, figuring if someone was in there, he surely would hit them. They were lucky that day. They didn't get hit. And I was able to meet some of the people that helped my parents, my dad, survive. But it wasn't until my second trip back to Poland that my life really changed forever. There was a professor that had traced his genealogy back to this little town. And he had asked the town to reconsecrate the Jewish cemetery. And so the day started where we come to town and we actually first went to that house that my dad had been at. And these neighbors from across the street come out and they started saying, you guys are the Schoenwetters, aren't you? And we're like, yeah, who knows us? And they said, we remember you. We used to play with you when you were a kid. And then it was as if they were purging their souls. And they said, and we remember when they used your house and they separated the Jews and that one guy, remember he, he escaped and they point to the ground and they said, this right here is where they beat him. And they told us if we help him, that we would surely die as well. And so we had to wait four days watching him die in the street. Well, I'm an emotional person, so that was a very, very crying day for me. But from there, we went into the center of town and about 40 townspeople had shown up and they put this plaque up on town hall, commemorating and acknowledging the fact that there was a Jewish community that had lived in this village. And I couldn't believe 40 people even cared and came out for this. But it was after this, when we walked into the center and from the center walked into where the cemetery was and we go down the street and as we turned the corner, we noticed that there is a huge tent that was erected. And over 600 townspeople came to witness this day. People with babes at their breast, to old people, as I mentioned, that had remembered my dad and my aunt. And they put on a beautiful ceremony for us. And after this, and it's hard to tell, there's these buses in the back, they actually put us on buses and they took us back to the local high school where these students, high school students, Googled with their parents authentic Jewish recipes and started to create a buffet for us that was over 20 feet long. And they put a concert on for us in Hebrew. Now I am in a part of Poland that is so backwards that when I was there in the nineties, they were in horses and buggies. These people have never met a Jewish person. They've never seen, no one that's been Jewish has even lived in this town since 1942. And this whole day as I'm witnessing this and these people that are opening their arms to me, you know, I grew up pretty cynical. I grew up knowing that just because I was different, that people were murdering my family. And the whole day, I had one thought in my head. What's in it for them? Because I couldn't believe that people would actually be good just because they're good, right? I mean, people don't do that. And all day I searched for that answer and I couldn't find it. And I went up to the principal afterward, and not the principal, excuse me, the uh, mayor afterward. And I said, I wanna thank you for what you've done here today. You've given me a place to bring my children back. And he said, I don't want your thanks. There are no thanks necessary. This is the only thing to do and the right thing to do. And I know it sounds corny, but I was changed. I was changed forever. I found this newfound faith in mankind. And that's what motivated me to come back and finally get my dad's story down. We started it as a blog and I would interview him every week for two hours at lunch, once a week, peppering him for six months with more and more questions. And it was for my family. I wanted my kids to know about the story and my cousins. But then it eventually turned into the book and we now go around speaking to adults and mainly students of all ages. We usually start as young as fifth grade, trying to spread this message of kindness and respect. Because you see, my grandfather was a kind landowner who treated his workers with respect. And it was because of the man he was that those people risked their lives saving his family. And you see, we all have a choice in the world. 
We can't turn the TV on today without seeing all these messages of violence and hatred and, and intolerance and all these horrible things. But each one of us has a voice. And it's up to us to decide how to choose to use that voice. And my dad, myself, and my sister have decided to use our voices and choose to use our voices to spread the message of kindness and respect and love. Because one day, if we're loud enough, our voices will drown out the voices of violence and hatred. And everybody needs to know that their voice counts. So with that, I'd like to introduce my dad, Mark Schoenmutter, who's going to share a little bit of highlights from his story. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers as well. So with that, dad, take it away. Thank you, Anne. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for being and listening to my survival during the Holocaust. I will give you some highlights how we went through this period of time that we were lucky to survive. Well, as Anne mentioned, I am from Poland, from a little town. You heard that my father was a farmer. You heard, I'm repeating a little bit, that there was a Polish family which helped my father in the farm working. They had two rooms in our house. And she mentioned, if I don't repeat, that he was the head of the Jewish community in town. So in 1939, when the war broke out, when the tanks went through our little town, we didn't expect anything terrible to happen because we were just under the impression the Germans invaded Poland. They're going to occupy Poland, of course. And we will continue to live whatever way we can live in our house on our farm. Well, how did we start finding out what they had in mind? Soon, a few months after they came in, because my father being the head of the community, com the Jewish community, they needed to know how many Jews in town, what they do, all the details. So they came in the first time for all the names and information about them. Then they came and they told my father that they are going to implement a law that all the Jewish people have to wear a band with a Star of David on their arm. Okay, a band. Then, not too long after that, they coming in and they tell him, well, from, let's say, tomorrow or day after tomorrow, all the Jewish kids going to public schools have to be taken out. They're not allowed to go anymore to school. That was it. Then they came and they tell my father, well, we need your property, your house and your land. We're taking over. So by tomorrow, you have to leave your house, take your personal belongings, and find yourself a place to live in town wherever you can. So my father goes around, find, rents a room in a Polish family house, and we move in there. So from now on, if they needed my father for any questions or anything, they used to call him to the police station. So every so often he would have gone, then came back home. One day, late in the evening, he's still not back. 
while well, my mom is waiting, waiting, but she sees he's not back. Then all of a sudden, she hears a knock on the door, opens the door, and who is the The wife of the Polish chief of police. And she tells my mom, listen, it happened that I overheard a conversation between my husband and the Gestapo. And they mentioned to my husband that in a few days, they're going to take all the Jewish people out from this town somewhere. I don't know where, what they going to do. So I suggest you take your two kids and run away from here. And she left. Well, mom didn't know what to do, but she decides she's taking me and my sister. She take the few little things with her, whatever we didn't have much anyway. And she goes back to our old house, to the family who lived in our house, the family of Mr. Piwat. She comes in and tells Mr. Piwat what she heard. And he tells her, okay, ah, it's late at night, you know. Why don't you go to, which happened to be his cousin and sleep over there and let him, pointing at me, let him stay with me and sleep with my kids. My mom left. He tells me, go and sleep between my kids. Early morning, next morning, the door opens and the Gestapo walks in. They go straight to his bed, they wake him up and they say, we were told that the Schoenwetter family is hiding in this house. Can you tell us where they are? So he looks at them and says, I'm sorry, but they're not here. So he looks at him and he says, listen, you're not cooperating. I have men with me, you can see. They're going to go, they're going to search the property, the house, everything. And I'm sure they're going to find them. But you know what we're going to do because you don't cooperate? We're going to take them and take you. We're going to kill all of you. Where are they? So he says, go, look, you're not going to find them. They're not here. So he tells his people, go start searching. They walked out and he's walking out. Then he stops, turns around, and he's pinpointing at one of the kids, which happened to be the oldest daughter. And he's saying to her, can you tell me how many brothers and sisters do you have? So she gives him a number. He counts whatever she said. That's it. That's what it is. So he walks out. Well, you can imagine I was the luckiest man in the world that she was smart enough to include me in the count of all the key kids. So Mr. Piwat walks in, he tells the kids, get up quick, get dressed, go outside, get yourself busy outside. And he tells me, and you go with them However, you run into the bushes behind the houses, hide there, don't come back to the house. Just sit there and wait till I come and I pick you up. And that's what happened. I was sitting there after a few hours, he came in, took me, we went to my mom. And he says to my mom, listen, I think it would be the best thing for you if you go to a ghetto. Nobody from this town, the police or the Gestapo would even suspect to think that you went to this town, where is this ghetto? So you live there, you'll be saved there. And he says, okay, that's what you suggest, let's do that. 
So it took us a few hours to walk to this town, walked into the ghetto. Mom takes two of us by hand and we start walking around looking for a place to live. Well, any building we walking into, it's packed, no room. While walking, we see people living on the streets. We walking and walking. Finally, my mom on the attic of one of the houses found small space, big enough just for three of us just to sit next to each other. So she grabbed the place and we start living in this place. Well, we were very hungry where to get some food. So she's asking one of the people, where can we get some food for you? Can you guide me, tell me? So the person says to her, the only way you're going to get food here, you stay in line twice a day. And when you get to the kitchen, they give you a portion and that's the food you get. So wait, soon they're going we're going to go and stand in line so you get some food. So the time came, we stood in line, got into the kitchen. So they gave us a cup of soup, they call it, which was basically warm water, nothing in it, just some color. And a slice of a dry piece of bread. Okay, we took this, we ate, and that was our meal. Well, the next morning, again, we stood in line. And in the evening, again, we stood in line. And those were the portions every day we used to get. Of course, we were <laughs> most of the day hungry. But there was no stores. Of course, we didn't have any money. Mom didn't have any money, but there was no stores. You couldn't buy anything. We didn't have any clothes with us, but so everybody else didn't have clothes. Every day, day and night in the same clothes. We got sick. My mom got sick. There was no medicine that you go to a drugstore and buy something. There was no such a thing. If you survive, what's good, you live. If not, you just die in the street or in the attic and then they came in, pick you up and whatever they took you, and throw you away somewhere. We had lies. My mom cut our hair. And basically, generally, there was this horrible living in this ghetto for about three or so months. Then rumors were going on that they were going to liquidate the ghetto. And one day, a little boy comes in and he says to my mom, a man is on the other side of the fence. He asked me if I can find you. He gave me the name. Let me show where he is. So mom goes, and who is there, Mr. Piwat again? Then he says to my mom, bring you two kids, and I show you how to get out from here quick. Okay, my mom ran, takes me and my sister, brings him over, brings us over. He takes a blanket, he throws over the barbed wire, and he tells my mom, pick one kid at a time and throw him over. Well, my mom tells him, uh, I don't have strength. I am weak. I, I, I don't think I can pick him up. So he says, I know you can. You're strong enough to pick him up. And besides, take a look at those two kids. They're skin and bone. 
There is no way there. You can do it. Just do it. So my mom tries and she did. She picks me up, my sister throws. Then he says, and you climb on top, jump over, and I catch you here. And that's how we got out from the ghetto. He took us into a little house next to it. And he says, okay, take your clothes off. They dirty and smelly. You cannot walk in the street like that. I have clothes for you. Here is some food, eat. So you get some strength. And then let's go. And that's how we walked out from this town. We walked again for a, quite a bit. We went to a village. He brought us to a, one of the farmers there and tells the lady, you promise to take some people with I bring, here they are. So she looks at mom, she looks at the two kids and she says to my mom, well, if I take you, you have to make sure one thing here, that those two little ones, they're not allowed to talk, not to cry, not to laugh, not one word. They have to be quiet constantly because I'm going to put you on the attic and you're going to live there, you're going to there, be there day and night. You're not going out or any place. You're just going to hide there. Are you promise? Can you, can you do that with them? So she says, yes, no problem. I guarantee you that they be quiet. So she says, okay, go up and cover yourself with hay and you live there. And that's what happened. We went, we lived there. She used to bring us food. Happened to be there was already like in the fall. So we were staying through the whole winter in her place. Then the summer came and she says to us, to my mom basically, sorry, but you have to leave. I cannot hold you any longer. So my mom start begging her, but she says, no more, that's it. I am afraid, I don't wanna, summer is coming, people walk around, I don't know. They may know this, no. Can you suggest, you know somebody, you recommend them? No, but I tell you what she says, why don't you go to the forest? It's a tremendously big forest. Plenty of rooms to walk around there. Why don't you go and hide there? So my mom doesn't have a choice. We walk in, walk and walk in the forest. We found ourselves a location between the bushes, comfortable location where we can hide in the bushes. And that's how we start living during the summer. Well, you may ask, what, how, what did you eat? How did you live? Well, basically being a farmer, she knew that in the, in the forest, there are some wild things growing. So she says to us, I'm going, we're going to walk around and look for mushrooms, berries or whatever it is growing and it's edible. And I'm going to teach you which mushrooms, for example, you can eat and which mushrooms are growing but they poison mushrooms. You have to learn and be, pay, be careful what you pick and you're going to learn. You're going to see, you're going to learn and know. And that's what we were doing, walking around, picking those things and we lived on those things. Sure, it was raining, we were wet. When the rain stopped, the sun came in, we took our clothes, hanged them under a tree. They dried out, we put them back on. And that's how we lived during the summer. 
Well, the winter comes in, it's cold, snow starts, late fall, cannot sit anymore. We don't have clothes, we don't have anything to, to, to even put to be warm in it. So, mom takes us and we walk to different villages, stop in a farm's house and begging them to take us. If they didn't take us, we went to another one. And if we got lucky, somebody took us, okay, we take you for one week. Then you have to find someplace else. So she made sure that we behave, we quiet and everything. So sometimes this one week became two or three weeks. But then unfortunately we had to leave, again walk around and find some other place to live. Then when the wet summer came, spring, summer, we went back to the forest and again we lived the same way. Well, again, the winter came. Again, we walked around and looked and begging farmers. Let me give you an example. Like one, it happened to be one winter. How we said, uh, how we were hiding. So we walk into this farmer and he says to mom, if I take you, I have to make sure that nobody will suspect where you lived or anything here. Because you know, if somebody is going to find out and the Germans come in, we're both in trouble. So let me think, come back in a couple days or so, and let me figure out something. So when we came back, you couldn't wait for those two days already to pass. So when we came there, he takes us to a pigsty. And he tells mom, take a look. I dig here a hole. But as you can see, the hole is very shallow. If you can go in here and you cannot even sit, you have to lay down and that's it. If you feel comfortable to be in this condition here, you can stay with in, in my place. So my mom says, of course, of course, no problem, I will. So he says, okay, step in, lay down. That's what we did. He takes pieces of wood, covers the whole top. Then we hear he's throwing hay on top of it. And then he brings in the pigs. And here we are. We in the hole, the pigs on top of us. He made a little hole on the side so he could shove in some food for us. And that's how we live through the whole winter. Just sitting in this hole. Well, but we were lucky that we had a location and we were not freezing in the snow. This happened to be after we got out from there again in the spring, we went back to the forest but soon after, a month or two months later, we start listening and we heard movement of trucks, tanks, then explosions. So we start hearing, uh oh, something is going on here. We cannot stay here anymore. So we moved out as much as we could to the side of the forest, closer to the village. And then we see people, groups of people going on, on this road. So my mom figured probably the people escaping the front line. So she takes two of us and she explains to us that from we're going to join one of the groups Wherever they go, we're going to go with them. And she started teaching us, explaining to us 
that from now on we have to be refugees, Polish refugees, and if somebody will be nice enough to take any of us or group of us, we're going to live in the house. So make sure that and she's showing us when you sit down and you eat, we hope everybody's going to pray. You have to pray. You have to cross yourself. You have to learn and listen how they pray and listen so you can learn this and then you can repeat the same thing. And when it's Sunday comes in, we're going to go to church. So make sure when you go to church and she explained to us when to get up, when to kneel and how to pray. And we walk with it. Then we just join one of the groups and one of the farmers took us and we start living with the farmer as refugees. And we lived like that through the winter. And then 1945, end of February, all of a sudden everything quiet down around us. And then one day we see some soldiers walking and we see that they dress differently. They're not German uniforms, different. We didn't know who they are, what is it? When they got to the house, they speak to us. Nobody understands one word what they say. But then one guy comes in and he starts speaking Polish. Oh, and he says, we are the Russian army. We liberated you. For you, the war is over. Now we make sure that there is no more Germans in the area here. So you can go do anything you want. You're free. Well, we just couldn't imagine how happy we were that we somehow survived the whole thing. And this was the day when we got liberated. So I think I will stop right here. And I am available for any question you have. You want to ask me if you do have any, I'd be more than happy to share with you anything else what you're interested in. Thanks again for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we actually already have a question in the chat. So if you have a question, if you want to just put it in the chat, I can um, I'll communicate that. So we have uh, one question from Lee and he wants to know um, for, for every farm that did take you in during the winter for a hiding place, did you have as many turn you away? Were there, were there a lot of people who turned you away? Well, that's not that many people turn us away. Again, I want to underline that my mom was the bravest woman in the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, but she had this feeling, she had the knowledge and she could understand people. Why do I say, for example, when we went into a farmer, and the farmer said, oh, no problem. Why don't you bring the kids? I, I understand, yeah, you need a place, it's too cold. Come in and you stay with us. But always mom went by herself. We used to stay a little bit away and wait for her. She told her, you stay here, I'll be back here. So she told him, Okay, let me go and get the kids. And she never walked in anymore to this house. Now, when she went to another house and the people said, well, I would like to take you, but I'm scared. You know, if they will find out that you're here and tell the police they would come in and they will take you and me 
So I don't want to risk my life and your life here. I feel bad for you. I really do. But you know the circumstances. So then my mom start crying and begging her, take me for a week. Then I go and I look for some other place. Okay, for a week, but no longer. So we went and we stood for this week, but sometimes this one week became two or three weeks because we behaved. We didn't talk, we didn't do any, we've been quiet. So somehow they let us stay longer and then we went and had to look for another place. So why did mom were making this decision? Because the Germans announced that if you going to show us where the Jews are hiding, we are going to give you a pound of sugar and maybe some a can of something with it. So mom knew if somebody is so anxious to take us, they probably waiting for this pound of sugar. That was her way of thinking. So that was the difference where we went and who was behaving, how someone was behaving. My mom was making the decision. I don't know if sufficient or not my answer, but. Yes, thank you, Mark. So I have another question. How old were you and your sister when you went into the forest to hide? I was at that point about probably six and a half, close to seven. My sister was about five, four mm -hmm. and a half. There's a difference between she's younger than me. Right, okay. Um, so the next question is, at what point did you find out what happened to your father? Okay, so I'll give you a quick story here, because it's related. While we were hiding in the forest, Mr. Piwat used to occasionally come and bring us a loaf of bread. And if he couldn't make it, he sent his son-in-law. And he brought us something to eat. One day he came in and my mom noticed that he's wearing a pair of shoe, shoes and she's asking him, where did you get those shoes? And he didn't want to tell her. So they go back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he says, okay, I let you know. I tell you how, where I got it. He says, one day after they were taking all the Jews. The Germans came in and they put Polish young men as to go to work. They put us on the trucks and they brought us to a forest. And they told us to dig a big, big hole. We worked and worked, we dig this hole. They brought us back to town. Then after a day or two, they came back to work. They put us on a truck and here we go, back to the same location. But when we got to the place where we dig the hole, this hole was full with dead bodies. So they gave us shovels, they told us to cover this whole thing up so there's no sign of anything. After we finished this work, they told us, okay, all the work you did, do you see here on the side, it's a big long line of all kinds of items. Because when they brought all those Jewish people there, they told them to take their own belongings with them. And then they told them to put them on the side. They told them to strip naked. They line them up and then the machine guns and they killed everybody. So they says, he says, they told me, told us, to pick one item for the work we did. So I was walking around and all of a sudden I, saw, I see your husband's shoes. So, because I recognize, I work with him every day. 
So I took the pair of shoes for memory to have something of his. So now you know that he was killed and he is in this forest. That's what we found out what happened to my father. And I just want to add, when you bring up, when I, I talk about how you can always find the good in everything that's bad. In 2011, they discovered the mass grave that my grandfather had been murdered in. It was deep in the forest and a hiker had been walking. And if you see this piece of stone up here on the right, a piece of that stone was peeking out from the leaves. And so the piece of stone says, it says right here what it says, that this is where the Germans killed 200 and some odd Jewish people. It gives the date. But again, somebody who participated in this didn't want it to go unnoticed. They risked their lives going back and marking this area so that hopefully one day in the future it would be found. And so I just, I always say, you know, you have to find there was this goodness. It, it, was, it was risky and they did it. And we actually hiked there. It, it's pretty far out there. It's a good 15 minute hike up into the forest there. So. Awesome. Thank you. That was, that was a, a great segue into, into that. So um, one last question, and I know it might, might be um, hard to do this in a, in a short amount of time, but I do have a question about, um, did you, your mom, and your sister come to America together? No. I was the only one who came to America. By myself, I came. My mom and my sister actually was, they, are, they were, my sister still lives. My mom was with her all the time, and they went in Israel. Mm. Okay. But the key here is, my dad actually lived in Poland under the communist regime until 1957. Hmm. So after the war, he stayed in Poland and it wasn't until 1957 when there was a change in leadership that there was a short window of one month where they allowed the Jews, let's say allowed, they said, if you're Jewish and you wanna leave, the only place you can go is Israel. Apply, if you get paperwork, you have to go right away. And that's what happened. My grandmother quickly applied and they all went to Israel. And then from there, in 1961, my dad came here to America. Well, thank you for for sharing um, for sharing with us, Mark. That was an extraordinary story. You had so many people help you along the way, and I, you're right, Anne. That is quite um, a wonderful story of the many kindnesses that people can have even during this time. And would you like want to take a few minutes to talk any more about your um, foundation and anything like that. I'm putting the um, links to those, uh, the two links you sent me in the chat, if you wanted to say anything here at the end. So I, I just would tell you the book website, the Together Our Journey for Survival website, that is a website that has some images and pictures there. So that's something that sometimes students go to just to see, put some faces to the words that they hear when they hear my dad speak. There is a section there for teachers in schools where you can request curriculum if you would like to accompany the book. You just send me an email. And uh, as I mentioned, you could also order books if you would like, or I think Lori's going to talk more about that. As far as the foundation goes, that is something my sister and I started about right in the nick of time. It was the November right before the pandemic. We launched our foundation. And so we give small grants. Uh, usually it's up to a thousand dollars to schools can be used for anything from books to paying for speakers. Some places are now using it for uh, virtual field trips. The Anne Frank house has an amazing virtual field trip as well. We have resources on our website for you as educators. If you go under the resources tab, there are some national resources there of free curriculum that you can get as well as links to different organizations. And then uh, we just finished our grant up cycle just now, but if you would like to get added to our list to know when the next grant cycle starts up, just send us a subscribe on there and we'll add you to the list so that you can stay up to date with our news and know when the next grant cycle is. 